<clears throat> okay, welcome we everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're just going to let a couple folks trickle in. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. If you're just joining, feel free to drop in the chat where you're watching from. I feel like we should have mood music or something if people are <laughs> <laughs> Again, if you're just joining, feel free to let us know where you're watching from. I'm in DC. That's where I'm tuning in from. I think Trish and Keisha are both in Maryland. I'm in Maryland. I am in Maryland. Okay, we got some people. Okay, we got Maryland, College Park, Maryland. Hi, Maya. Ellicott City, awesome. Gaithersburg, this is cool. Come on, somebody bring out Thailand or something. Give folks one more minute and then we will get started. If you're just joining, feel free to chat in the chat box where you're tuning in from. So far, we have a lot of Maryland folks. Okay, I spoke too soon, Atlanta, Georgia. Yay. Okay, it is 12.01. We are going to get started. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ellie Garrity. I'm the manager of alumni career programs with the Alumni Association. We're so excited that you're able to join us for today's class of 2020 webinar, Hindsight is 2020, with alumni Trish Povlitz and Keisha Hansard. This webinar is part of the Alumni Association's Class of 2020 webinar series in which we hope to provide thought-provoking and valuable content that will help recent and new alumni like you achieve your personal and professional goals. We have a lot to cover today, but we want you to get the most out of this interactive webinar, so please feel free to submit your questions through the chat box like some of you have already been telling us where you're tuning in from. Now I'll hand it right over to Keisha and Trish to introduce themselves and get things started. Trish and Keisha, take it away. Yeah, just to kind of kick it off, I, I would say welcome to everybody. I wish I thought of this clever title, Hindsight is 2020. And one of the things I think is so important, even though it's been a very odd year, I do feel that 2020 has, has given you, our new graduates from Maryland, a very, uh, real dose of perspective. And, you know, I, I look forward to see what the class of 2020 does with that perspective because it's so important. So, yeah, well, we'll go, go ahead and go to the next slide then, Ellie. <clears throat> right, so am I unmuted, which is always my problem. Great, hi everyone. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, I'm Keisha Hansard. You can see that I graduated in the class of 89. The deal I made with my parents is if I was a dance major, I had to choose something else where I could possibly get paid for it. So I was journalism, but it was a great combination for me. Um, I wish that when I was a new alum that there was this kind of programming. When I graduated, George Bush, the father, was the president. We had a huge recession. It was just a hot mess. But the people that were able to guide me through 
for years um, and even still have been alums and mentors. And so I felt really humbled to be able to be back and, and part of this. You can see I was active in different activities. So in a, a dance performing group, in my sorority, I was news editor for a news magazine that I don't think is on campus anymore. And I think the part that maybe resonates for you all, I hope, one, I've been laid off from a position before. And so I had to get back on track to figure out what was going to be next. So I've done that. I came out of school during a really funky kind of uh, economy. So I understand when you have to branch out your, um, your network, look at different opportunities. And in the last 25 plus years, I've been student facing. And so I've worked on corporate partnerships with employers but I've worked in uh, graduate or MBA admissions, career services. And then um, when I was on campus, I was my last role was director of diversity initiatives at the Smith School. Um, right now I'm a career coach at the Kogod School of Business at American University. And yeah, I can't wait for your questions and I'm just really eager to be a part. I'll turn it over to Trish. Yep, next slide, Ellie. So I'm also an alum, class of 90. Uh, that picture on the right there, you, you can tell I'm the shrimp in the middle. My son, Vincent, is a junior at Maryland. This is from last year's Ohio State Maryland game in Columbus at the Shoe. So I was bummed to hear that the football game was canceled this weekend against Ohio State, but we have family in Columbus, so we've got a pretty good rivalry going on. But uh, I was a political science major and uh, Italian minor, part of Cap Alpha Theta, and I'm a certified HR leader, have been in HR for over 20 years now. So I'm on the corporate side of things. Um, like Keisha, I have been on both sides of a layoff situation, having been laid off myself, but also having to execute layoffs and large workforce reductions. So I know what it's like to, to go through that, and I know how hard it is to find a job, particularly in these trying times. Um, while I was uh, at Accenture, I was there for about 13 years. I was one of the corporate advisors to Maryland Smith School and met with students, gave seminars on resume writing, interviewing workshops, um, even doing mock interviews for like behavioral type interviews, which was pretty helpful. I have reviewed thousands of resumes in my career. I have done hundreds and hundreds of interviews as well, both campus, very experienced senior level interviews. Um, and do consider myself a behavioral interviewing expert. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, I also speak locally at Anne Arundel County High Schools about resume writing, interviewing, gen general professionalism. So you'll get some of that here. We're obviously just taking it up a couple of levels being college graduates. And I'm soon gonna be launching my own company uh, specifically focused on helping high school and college students make that transition. So part of what I'm sharing with you is what I would be helping clients with, potential clients with, and have some already, but really kind of that one-on-one -on -one focus to help them transition, hopefully more successfully to that next phase in life, even if that means demystifying some of the process, having 20 years of corporate HR experience, both in recruiting and, and HR generalists. But that's going to be the name of my company, KiteLine Consulting and Coaching. So you'll see that's a little bit of a nod to Cap Alpha Theta. So, all right, Ellie, next slide. All right, so we are gonna start with a polling question. I think Ellie, you're gonna run that for us. So when looking at a resume, what's the best indicator of strong performance from a potential hire? Is it A, spelling and grammar? Is it overall GPA? Is it the type of degree that you have or is it the specific university you're graduating or graduated from? Go ahead and pop your answer in there, whatever you think it is, we'll see what everybody comes back with. When looking at a resume, what's the best indicator of strong performance from a from a future hire. I feel like we needed to have like some music here. Not like Jeopardy music. <laughs> like Jeopardy music or something. <laughs> next time, next time. Yeah, I am a fan of music. It just kind of helps set the mood a bit, kind of keeps things fun and keeps things moving a little bit. So we'll see what people come back with. <clears throat> Okay, about 10 more seconds. If you want to get your vote in, you've got a couple more seconds, and then I'll share the results with everybody. All right. Spelling and grammar, 75%, overall GPA 10, 
Yep, 10, 10 yep, 5%. Yeah, I have to say, being a grammar and word nerd myself, uh, yes, it is spelling and grammar. I uh, took a, a analytics course last November with SHRM, Society for Human Resources, and they did a big study, I think it might have been Bloomberg, and they looked at who their strongest performers were and looked at the title of the resumes, and it was really spelling and grammar. So I have to admit, I'm one of those that if I see any kind of spelling or grammar errors on a resume, it's in the shred bin. Resume goes in the shred bin. So let's let's talk a little bit more about your resumes. And I think Keisha's gonna uh, take the lead on these next set of slides. And so, you know, a big part, not, not because I was a journalist, um, or maybe it is the hybrid of being a journalist and a former dancer. Um, narrative is a really big part of career, right? What's your story? How do you convey to somebody else what you're looking for? Um, how, do you, how do you package all of this up? And so when you start looking at articles and resources, you see a lot of things out there about personal brand, about your ability to be a storyteller. And so even though there's a lot that happens in career search and exploration, we wanted to break this down into sort of three quick chunks, knowing that we could do a whole, whole session on each one of these. But if we start with the resume, you know, your resume should highlight what's going to be most relevant in terms of your experience and your skills, competencies for the role that you're applying for. So if you were looking at nonprofit management and then also looking at maybe something in public policy, there could be some overlap. In, in their resume, but sometimes people are looking in sort of two food groups, so you might have two different resumes right. Um, and it's just two different versions, maybe one that's a little bit more strategy and management and maybe the other one that's more marketing. But then this way you're always highlighting the, the words that an employer is looking for the skills needed for the specific role. So if you're editing your resume, one of the things that I highlight for clients all the time is to don't just delete the extra stuff that you're editing from your resume, move that into your extra file. It could be for future versions, it could be for cover letters, it, it helps you keep track of your narrative. So don't feel like anyone's asking you to take something away because it's not good, but it just might not be most relevant for, for the role. Um, an exercise I like to do with folks is to dissect a job description. So you would take a job description, you can do it on a laptop, or you can do it with a paper and highlighters. I love highlighters. But you, you go through and you start highlighting the things that you know you can do, the things that you've done in the past. Um, also highlight the things that you don't like doing in terms of duties and projects and things that you haven't done. When I do a workshop, if I walk around, if two colors, maybe pink and green, the things that you don't like or you haven't done a lot of, if I can see that on your job description, that one is not the right fit and might be a later job or you're moving in the wrong direction, you know, for you. Um, but that's another good way to also go back and double check for language. Cover letters, and I recognize that with LinkedIn, Easy Apply and some others, you don't actually have to do a cover letter. But what those platforms are doing or is they're pulling language in what would be the replication of a cover letter. So go ahead and dissect that job description. What is the employer actually asking for? And then highlight how you've done that and demonstrate that skill in the cover letter. When you look for examples, there are templates with bullets, there are templates with a paragraph. Um, find the way that you feel best about explaining what you've done. I am a bullet girl. I like to read through a job description, what are the three or four buckets that the employer is looking for, and how can I demonstrate that I've done this in the past. Um, and full transparency, I'm leaning to the side because I'm being attacked by a three-month-old puppy who has finished his treat a little early, apologies. Um, but when you're writing your cover letter, you want to go ahead and include the job title um, and the job number so that you're able to be considered for the right role and it helps you track. Um, instead of dear sir or madam, since I am, I don't feel like I'm a madam and I'm not a sir, but go ahead and either do a specific person if you can figure that out or a hiring manager or selection committee and that would be fine. I recommend for anything that you're going to be submitting anyway, create a PDF so nothing can be changed. It'll upload smoothly. Also, if you hang on to that, 
you can use the cover letter later. Same thing with the job description, because once they close the process down, you can't find that to prepare for interviews. So create a PDF of the job description and your cover letter, and it'll help you prepare for the interviews. Um, one thing I wanted to note is that LinkedIn now has interview practice. And so it allows you to record responses to sample questions. Anybody that you're connected to on LinkedIn, you can send that recording to that person and they can give you some feedback. Um, and I think that we're gonna cover a little bit more on interviews, um, but I'm gonna turn this over to Trish and quiet a puppy. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> yeah, um, interviews will come on the latter half of the, of the deck, but this is these are some expected basics when it comes to your resumes. You know, you have to be as concise and succinct as possible. It gets a little more challenging when you've got as much experience as Keisha and I do trying to keep things to two pages, but that that's, that's part of the challenge too, is to convey what, what you will bring to the table, even in just two pages. And I'm gonna say proofread, proofread, never, never rely solely on face check. If it helps to pick up spelling errors, read it from left to right. Um, you know, cause also uh, with the spell check, things like ma manger will get through as project manager, right? We're not hiring any project managers, not, not last time I've checked. Uh, so make sure that you read it and always have somebody else read it. And, you know, I think that, you know, Keisha referenced narrative earlier. Yes, we're both bullet point people. You know, you want to have very clean fonts. White space is good. You don't want to like cram every single space on the pages with, with wording. Um, it's just a lot easier for interviewers to read. Um, and here's the grammar nerd in me use action verbs, simple tense, avoid passive voice um, and minimize acronyms or at least spell them out initially in the first place because acronyms could mean something different from one industry to another. I run into that a lot from one country to another. Um, you know, I, I, my parent company is a British company so they, they spell things differently. They have different acron acronyms. On the content side, if you're just out of school, it, it is good to put your education right at the top. Uh, Keisha and I, kind of talked about this professional summary bit, um, you know, I would expect to see professional summary at the top with somebody who's more experienced, but, you know, if you don't have a, enough experience for well-written summary, then you might just want to skip that. Um, although it's not listed on here, don't waste space at the top with what an objective is, what your objective is. If you're applying for a job and sending your resume, they know what your objective is. Um, certifications, memberships also have those closer to the top. Um, I know Keisha's mentioned, we'll probably talk about, about how there are student rates and fees, sometimes even free membership fees for students. Um, chronologically is still typically expected, but individual situations may need create creativity. Maybe you took time off to start a family, raise your kids, and you went back to school later, finished your degree later. Uh, you know, maybe you got laid off and couldn't get back into the workforce for a period of time. So Keisha will talk a little bit on the next slide about how to address some of those you know, individualized situations. And competency style can be used if there is that time gap. So maybe you want to focus more, like for me, I would focus more on HR experience up at the front versus a chronological. Sometimes that's a good way to kind of get around, um, you know, any type of time gap potentially. So next slide, Ellie. Yeah, that's easy. Shift. Right. So we, we thought about some of the individualized situations. You know, I think that there are a lot of... I am over snacking treating this puppy. Um, everyone's gonna have something specific that they feel like stands out on their resume um, that might be maybe a little bit of an obstacle, but I, we, we decided that these were some of the ways that perhaps can help you to think about what you're presenting um, to the reader. So remember the reader is always um, a potential partner, a uh, future employer. And so if you're working multiple jobs, and I was doing that in school and even after school, you're doing those in chronological order because when the employer has to read and the start dates that are going back and forth, it's a little tough. The other thing is it tells somebody that you had to manage your time doing two things at the same time. So if that's class, you're an RA and an internship, that's a lot going on. And if you're doing that successfully, you know, that, that speaks just volumes. Um, some of us were in school and worked full-time or worked part-time. And so you could in a bullet in parentheses, especially if part of that was full-time or part-time, you can address that as, as well. Um, and it just lets the employer know that you were doing something that might not be as they might think to be more traditional. Family on businesses, I love this because 
Um, one, things don't shut down at dinner time. Often it's still a staff meeting, right? Um, but in family owned businesses, often you are tasked with working, uh, either wearing a whole lot of hats, but that's you being agile, collaborating with others. So also talk up the people and the situations that are external to the family, vendors, clients, marketing, translation, whatever that's going to mean. Um, I think sometimes people are concerned if I worked with a smaller organization or a startup that's not a big brand, how can I get that across? You can use a one sentence. So it's um, Acme delivery, and then your title, and then one sentence can just give a really good sense of who your clients are, breadth of the business, what your region or capture is. Um, and so sometimes that really helps because sometimes your clients are really bigger names and sometimes it just really helps the reader understand a scope of your responsibilities and projects. Um, other things that we're seeing quite a bit, you know, should I put my visa status on a resume? If you have permanent residency, uh, OPT, CPT, you could include that um, on a resume. Um, in terms of remote roles, if it was remote, that's fine to say, and it doesn't have a location. People were remote before COVID, and so that's totally fine. Um, I think the other thing that becomes really um, common is a COVID termination. You were made a job offer, but they had to cancel it. You know, that's a really good hint to a future employer that Hilton wanted to hire you, but they couldn't bring you on. Um, that means you got all the way through that process, and that's fine. At some point, you'll have another experience, and that'll come off. But if, especially if it's been really recent, that's totally fine to keep on. Uh, something that I want to add on here, oh, yep. not on the slide necessarily, but if you think about that word individual, as, as you're writing your resumes, remember that this is the best opportunity to tell the best version of yourself on paper. So you want to really highlight the things that you contributed to, you know, projects that you led, things that were more specific to your role uh, or tasks, things that you owned outright. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I see on resumes is that they just read like generic job descriptions, you know, even for past work experience. Granted, a lot of your experience is going to be education related, you know, part time job related, but you, know, you still want to focus in on what your specific responsibilities were as the individual. And we'll talk a little bit more about differentiating yourself uh, when we get to the interview piece in a couple of slides. But I think the next slide, Ellie, is we just want to open it up for some initial questions about resumes, um, what folks might have. This is a good place to stop for that. And as folks are thinking of their questions, the last thing I'll just say about resumes is I like to think of every bullet as uh, project plus Trish equals great stuff. So really every bullet could tell a story, but you want to be able to show results impact. It's sometimes very difficult to quantify. People say that all the time, but as much as possible, I think having a buddy is a great idea so that they push back and say, is there anything you left out? Did you accomplish something? Have you forgotten to include something in this bullet? All the way through. And that just helps to make sure that you're being very inclusive. Let's see if we have any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat. People are welcome to unmute and throw them out there if it would help. Let me see, we have one from Grace. Would it be confusing to hiring managers if there are multiple part-time jobs? My resume lists them in chronolo chronological order, but I still worry it's confusing. I, I don't think so because I think that often, so there's a couple of things. In a gig economy, when you've been a student, um, you know, think of the on-campus job and an internship at the same time. I, I think that employers are used to seeing that. If you were listing things in a funny alphabetical order, or it's just not in chronological order where you, you mentioned 2016 and then 2020 is below it, that's just really hard for someone to get in front of your narrative. So I don't think it's very uncommon for, for a lot of reasons for some of us to be working on different projects or at different jobs at the same time. Great question. And hello, Chicago. I, <laughs> I, I think you'll want to highlight 
that it is part time. So you'll want to put in parentheses the time frame you're there part time. Uh, in some cases, people do return internships. So if it's one internship, you know, put the most recent, you know, in that chronological order, and then just also have next to it perhaps the second time period, earlier time period that you were there. You can call that out in the same line. Other questions? Oh, here's one from Amy. I work in the startup world. I have had a few job where success is often not met, but I have been told I have had too many jobs and how do you position working in this field without looking unfaithful to a job? Great question. I think one of the things in a cover letter um, and in an interview, it helps to bring to life what's going on behind the scenes. So if you've been really um, drawn to startup culture, startup community, innovation, um, being flexible, working on a lot of different kinds of projects with different people, I think you can bring that up in an interview and in, in cover letters. Um, yes, I think that I think that there are still some traditional employers that are not, they're hoping that you haven't been job hopping every year or every couple of months. But I think when you're able to give um, some context around that. So if you have three uh, startup roles in one year, if they've been contract, 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 in parentheses, you can add that it's been a contract role. And so that helps somebody understand that maybe that was the bandwidth that that uh, project had or that employer had, but it wasn't like, oh, I'm bored and I'm moving on to the next. Even if you were bored, you wouldn't say that. You went yeah. to challenge. Right. Yeah, because I have a lot of like one year contracts where it's like we want to explore a new market. So I'll go in there in a pretty high level role. And then there, I get this sort of like, huh, you didn't stay. Um, but the role ends, you know, the board decides they don't want to move on, you know, move on with what you're doing. So it, it's I've found myself befuddled how to explain it. I, I, I did have a big CEO say to me, you know what I don't like about you is just to have too many jobs. You got phenomenal experience with too many jobs. So, and sometimes that's industry specific. Like consultants move more than maybe school teachers. And I, I but I guess it depends. I, I have known other people that are school teachers and school counselors who've done quite a bit of movement because they're on micro contracts because there's a very urgent issue in a school system or in a county or something's going on. So. Hopefully, uh, I didn't see that, Nicola. Hopefully, you're able to um, help somebody understand that it was a, a, a contract, that it was either, you know, it was just a short window and then you moved on or, you, or somebody contacted you about a new role and you were able to rise to that. I think it helps some, a CEO who might be from a more traditional sort of people come and stay for three to five years, understand that your movement wasn't... Um, a, a lack of loyalty or dedication, um, but the contract just might have been over. Situational, yeah. Um, yeah, that was Amy's question. Nicola's question is, as a follow-up to the above, if you have too many positions and want to fit everything in your resume, could you only include selected work experiences to show gaps? I, I would say that Sometimes it does depend on the gap, how long the gap is. Um, you know, if, if you want to highlight particular experience and you may want to consider going to more of like a, a functional experience type resume versus chronological, and then you can just have the chronological sort of listed below, you know, sort of just as one as line items, title, years there, whatever, the, you know, the time there, whatever that is. Um, but, you know, some people will pick up on gaps and some people just don't like them, but, you know, it, it's, it's also how do you highlight the experience and the results and the impact that you bring. Um, I think we'll take maybe one or two more. Joe's question is some companies have a section to attach a resume but not a cover letter or your resume is exacted into their format which can be annoying. Uh, is, there, is there not space to attach a cover letter should you make it a page of your resume? I would recommend not making it a page of your resume. If they're asking specifically for a resume then I would do that. Um, you know if you feel that there's something in your cover letter that would help sort of explain some of the resume, I would try to find a way to work that into the resume itself. But, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it an, another section. If they're asking for a resume, just give them a resume. Um, we'll take this last one from looks like Sydney Espinosa. 
is there a way to put freelance jobs on your resume um, in journalism and work on projects from editing podcasts to editing videos for digital news? How would you list that on a resume? So the, this is almost like gig jobs, right? So I, um, it's funny because I stayed freelancing after I had actual paid jobs with benefits. Um, and so I had a freelance section. Um, and I think that some people use freelance slash um, consultant yeah. as, as a header, and that could be something else. It's still experience. So it depends on how many hours. Um, I think if you're doing a whole lot, it becomes hard to capture mm -hmm all of those projects because it might just take you beyond like a one page or even bump you if you have a lot of work experience to two pages. So maybe if you do some of the highlights, um, you know, and, and you're hoping that it's enough uh, to demonstrate skill, diversity of projects. Um, but this is great because this is definitely where journalism is going. And that also lets people know that you're working on some other things and that you're bringing a really full skill set. So yeah. Um, um, these last two questions will be quick, so I think we can take these. Are these guidelines from Clark, are these guidelines primarily targeted for positions in the private sector? No, not necessarily at all. I mean, these are pretty tried and true expected, you know, resume points. Um, and then what type of resume format will be computer friendly? Typically it's Word or PDF. Um, I think I'd mentioned earlier, not too many graphics, because even for me, I'm a stickler. If you can see on the slide right now, I've got my accents above the E's in resume. I like my punctuation properly, especially for foreign words, but it doesn't pick it up, in, you know, necessarily in the title. So um, I, you know, avoid fancy graphics, fancy bullets. Um, it'll, it'll convert over more easily and upload more effectively into whatever uh, job application site the, the employer is using. So um maybe we'll take this last one from joe at the end of the session but i would like to go ahead and move on then to the interviewing so hopefully we can have time to come back to that if not joe if you feel feel free to email me directly and i can help answer your last question all right interviewing tips do's and don'ts uh, pretty general lots of information here go ahead next slide ellie all right so your resume is great. Your cover letter is awesome. You're getting a lot of activity and bites on your resume and your job applications. What are some of the things you can do in advance of an interview? We all know research the organization and if possible, the opportunity itself aside from the job description. See what you can find out about the company. Um, and one thing that's always good to remember is, well, yes, you're looking for a job to get hired with this company you know they've got to be a fit for you as well so maybe you like their corporate responsibility information maybe you like the company's core values those things have to speak to you too so this goes both ways uh, check your network for who you know um, you know maybe to get some solid insight to a company or even an introduction potentially um, i just wouldn't expect if you do know somebody at a company do not expect them to actually you know have any influence to whether or not you get the job um, practice your elevator speech. Uh, Keisha is going to cover that on, a, on the next uh, future slide, which I think will be helpful. Um, have go-to examples of your own real situations that highlight your best. And I would add even your worst. We'll talk about this when we get to the behavioral interviews, uh, because sometimes companies want to know, what did you learn from a tough situation? How did you react to it, right? How, what was your response? What are the things you specifically said? So it, you might think that it makes you look bad, but if it was a good outcome, and if you learn from it and you know something was salvageable even companies actually look for how people do in those situations um, prepare good thoughtful questions for the interviewer and ask them in an interview if they say so do you have any questions for me please don't say no i'm good please have at least one or two questions to ask and we've even provided you with some examples at the end of the deck to help you along with that and be able to articulate what differentiates you. Uh, Keisha talked about this, right? I think about it more from a cause and effect because of Keisha, this was the effect in that role, right? This was the outcome, these were the results. So you wanna make sure that you capture things that differentiate you uh, in not only on your resume, but also in an interview. And also always plan to arrive early. Doesn't matter if it's Zoom, it doesn't matter. Always be there early. Uh, you never wanna be late because that's like strike one right away. And you'll be lucky if you get even past that for the impression that you've made. So next slide, Ellie. All right, Keisha's gonna cover this one on how to nail your elevator speech. I love this formula. So the elevator pitch, you know, I'm an MBA career coach now at, at AU and my students tell me, hourly that they hate 
this. But if you're going to a career fair, or you're going to a career conference um, and going, I know I'm adorable because everything is virtual right now. It is the way that you're offering an anchor for someone else to get a sense of why are you in front of me? And so what have you done? What are you doing? What are you looking for? And so when you don't really have a pitch and someone says, what are you interested in? And you say marketing and film, oh, and beauty products and travel. And it, it feels like, and while that's all great, and I have a lot of you know interest myself, it's hard for an alum or an employer to figure out there's no anchor, no hook. How are they going to help you? Um, when I was at the Smith School, Yes, I actually had my students in a workshop on the elevator, go up four floors, come back down four floors. And so hopefully you were done with your pitch by the end. It drove everybody else in the building nuts, but there were a lot of giggles and it proved a point. So I did have engineers who then came to the business school at Smith and out of just let me see if this works, a formula helped them. You do not have to adapt this formula, but if you were going to whittle down what goes in your pitch, Maybe either your past experience or experience, talk a bit about your degree, what you study, what your future goals are, because you're going towards the value add that you bring. So if I had to do it for myself, you know, my career has been in higher education. And even though I have degrees in counseling and human resources, what I really want to do is to be able to provide students with strong service clear focus and the ability to explore careers. What I bring to your company is admissions experience, alumni development and employer relations. And so students will always feel like I'm able to provide perspective. So I just did that very fast. I don't know if it's fantastic, but it gives you something to hook onto. It didn't talk about dance or, you know, that I'm a urban gardener or, you know, I didn't bring in necessarily all the extra, extra things. I try to keep it very, very short. Um, so there are a couple of things that you can do. If you had to start fresh and clean, think of elevator pitch as your introduction, right? If you had to introduce yourself to me or to Trish and you had two minutes, what would you say? And record it on your phone. Now do it in a minute, do it in 30, do it in 10. I know it gets really goofy and silly at the end and hopefully you're going to be giggling, but it lets you see how clear you can get your language how concise you can get. Um, in the past, I used to do it on post-it notes. So you would have a, a three by three, which I don't think you can see here. Then I would have my students do the smaller ones that I think are a one and a half by two. And then I found these Japanese post-it notes that are the size of a thumbnail. And I would say, introduce yourselves, go to town, right? So that all got real goofy and silly. But the point is you wanna have an anchor, have a reason um, for someone to, to wanna engage a little bit more. Every time you go to a networking event, a meeting, something, think fully about what you're trying to get out of the situation, what you're trying to get across. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to think of it as selling if that makes you uncomfortable. Think of it as introduction. If the exercise of imagining that you're in the dreaded middle seat of an airplane and there are people side by side, and if you're just being pleasant and you casually introduce yourself, that's still like an elevator pitch and introduction. It's still going to give nuggets. Um, you've got hours on the flight, but it, hopefully that takes it down a little bit. You can meet somebody at any kind of uh, opportunity in the grocery store at something that's career related. So hopefully this will help you focus a bit and take some of the pressure off. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to say when you an elevator pitch is definitely the shorter. Think of it like speed networking, speed dating. But I will also say that if you get into an interview and the interviewer says, so tell me a little bit about yourself. What's your story? What's your journey? Chances are they haven't actually read your resume ahead of time. So they're buying time while they're flipping through your resume, right? But you're kind of giving them the background, the backdrop for what they're about to interview, interview you for. So elevator pitch, shorter speech. Tell me right. about yourself. That'll be a little bit longer buying them time, the interviewer time to actually read through your resume. Well, the other thing is often we all start to sound the same. And so yeah. walk me through your resume or tell me about yourself. Is the refresh if they have read your resume already, but there are so many other folks that have similar experiences. It helps to make it fresh again. Right. Great. Next slide, Ellie. All right. Some of you have probably come across these already, but this is a good outline of the various types of interviews out there. 
informational screening. Often that's with the recruiter initially or somebody on the recruiting team just to see if you're a, you know, a fit, you know, on at, you know, at face value. Skills and technical assessments that will be more, you know, do you have the right very specific skills that they need? You know, maybe you need to have coded in a particular language or maybe you need to speak a particular language. So they, you know, there's a way to test that out um, and interview for those. Panel interviews with multiple interviewers can feel a bit like an inquisition. If, if the interviewers are good, it'll just feel like a conversation. Personality types, this can be sometimes where you do an online test or assessment, you have multiple choice. You know, I, I've seen them where I've, you know, people have asked you to fill in like 70 questions. They're trying to figure out your fit, your personality and cultural fit for their organization. Um, behavioral or situational interviews, this, I'll cover this more on the next slide. Um, case studies, you know, this is more give us an example of, you know, a particular type of situation, scenario, you know, more of like a formal, I think, uh, business end to end type situation they're looking for. Uh, video and artificial intelligence interviews, um, you know, I, th this is more and more common now with us all being remote for the most part, um, you know, and I, I know that there are some some of the video interviews where you only get a certain number of times to record your answers to a question. So it's a one way, to, it's a one way thing, but they're gonna, you'll have the questions and you'll have to respond, it'll be recorded. And then on the back end, the hiring team will review those video clips of your responses. Um, artificial intelligence is a little bit different. That actually requires some programming for things, you know, that they are looking for in these, in these video interviews for the most part. I'm not a fan of those. Um, I, personally, I find that there's an opportunity for some, some bias to be in those, depending on who's doing the programming. Um, so, uh, you know, but still, you know, you would have just a small amount of time to actually answer questions that were put in front of you. But I would say, particularly in, in you know, the environment we're all finding ourselves in now, be prepared for any and all of these types of interviews, whether it's Zoom, by phone, could still be in person, potentially physically distanced, who knows, uh, but you wanna be prepared for any one of these. And, and companies have very different, uh, you know, approaches and styles to what kinds of interviews. Some are very measured, some are very methodical. You know, some people will interview specifically for this particular uh, characteristic that they're looking for. The next interview, interviewer will look for another characteristic that the company really believes their people need. So anything you want to add to that, Keisha? The only other thing I would add about artificial intelligence um, on the one-way interviews, and even if it's if it's live with, with other folks on the other end, they are listening for keywords and skills and competencies. So it's keeping a running count. Um, I, I, I think because we're going to cover some more. So I'll just stop there. Okay. All right. Next slide, Ellie. All right, I do want to expand a little more on these behavioral situational interviews. This is part of helping to demystify the process for you, which could give you a little more confidence going into these. These are the ones that really stress people out. And the premise behind it is really, um, I remember you know, my early days with Accenture, we actually had a team of psychologists come in and assess and analyze our most successful partners and figured out what are those qualities, characteristics, you know, capabilities and competencies that these most successful partners have. And then they came up with a whole battery of questions to be able to ask and dig at whether or not interviewees have those, uh, those qualities, those candidates. Now, if you're hiring just off campus, it's more, do you, do you show evidence of having the potential for those? And the, the best way to figure out how somebody will act in a situation is how they've already acted in a situation. So that's where you'll hear the, you know, the questions. So tell me about a time where you had to disagree with somebody you reported to or somebody who was in charge. How did that situation turn out? You know, what did you do? So those, that's the kind of question you'll get for that. Um, and one of the things to remember, because, um, and I see this frankly a lot with women, I've done a lot of, of women coaching um, programs and initiatives, and a lot of women feel that they can't take credit for things themselves. They have to be a team player. And, and in general, people want to come across as a team player, but these behavioral interviews are about you. They wanna know what you did. They wanna know what you said. They wanna know how you felt even, quite frankly. And they're not hiring your team. They're not hiring the project or your whole fraternity or sorority. They are hiring you, they're considering you. So they will want to hear you say, well, 
I answer the question with this, or I manage the budget as such. You know, they really, it's okay to say I and me because it is about you and the situation. As I said, the best indicator for how somebody will react in a situation is how they've already reacted. So that's what they're looking for. And you do wanna be prepared with some solid examples of your stories and situations have plenty of exam examples to draw from. Um, even if you don't have a lot of direct work experience, things can be school related, personal, sports, volunteer, all of that can work for a situation. I will tell you that Amazon interviews, Amazon Web Services, they want like a hundred different scenarios. So you can't use the same story twice when you're interviewing with them, with their situational interviews. So you might feel like you don't have a lot to offer, but you don't need to have it rehearsed but you want to have examples that you can draw from. You know, maybe it's a project that didn't go well. Maybe it's how you were overwhelmed. You know, they're also going to ask you, you know, tell me about the best project you delivered, some things like that. So you want to have examples to draw from without being overly rehearsed. And the point that I mentioned earlier, even if you think a situation might put you in a bad light, maybe it was a failed project, right? I mean, I've been asked, tell me about a project that went off the rails, right? And you want to, it's a good opportunity to, while yes, it went off the rails, that's the premise of the question and the situation, it's still an opportunity for you to show, here's how I achieved success still out of that, or here's what I learned, or here's how we got it back on track, whatever the case may be. And this is a big one. Do not try to finesse or fake your situations or examples, because I promise you, a really good behavioral interviewer like myself will trip you up. And I have caught people called them out, not so much in the room, but I know I know BS when I hear it. And we are trained to ask very specific probing questions that will get at, okay, well, you really didn't say it. If you can't tell me specific things that you said in that situation, then you're using your buddy's example that you thought sounded good. So you want to make sure that you are speaking specifically from your own questions, your, the questions addressing your own situations, because I promise you, you will get tripped up. So... I just said in a workshop on Monday, we can still smell BS even through the Zoom machine, so. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm a pretty tough interviewer. I mean, I've made experienced people sweat it out because they're just talking, right? They're just talking. They're not actually giving me things that I can go on. And, and if I can't tell somebody can hit the ground running on my team, right, when I'm interviewing them and you're just talking fluff, you know, that's, that's my job is to get in at, are you, can you really do right what your resume says? So that's part of the behavioral interviewing as well. All right, next slide. All right, so that's some of the prep piece. So now it's showtime. You're getting ready to go in for an interview, right? Whether it's on Zoom, whether it's in person. I love this quote by Will Rogers, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And I'm gonna tell you the things that matter might seem small, but interaction on the left there, firm handshake, that's noticed right away. I actually crack up inside when I know my hand shakes better than the guy's hand that I just shook and he has to like double pump me back as he realized it too. So you wanna have a firm, hand, firm handshake, get it right the first time. Uh, appropriate eye contact in an interview. I know you're always, people are told maintain good eye contact, but if you're really kind of like staring, it can be a little bit creepy. So appropriate looking away, maybe it's looking down a little bit your resume. You just don't wanna be like staring at them the entire time that they're asking you questions and you're responding to the questions. It could be a little creepy. Um, you want to be engaged and attentive. Listening without bias, that means actually hear the question asked of you. People often hear the question and or the part, part of the question, and they're already formulating a response in their minds before they've actually heard it. And there may be something at the end there that they throw out that you missed, and then you end up talking in circles. Or worse, you're talking and talking, and then they'll bring you out, okay, but here's the question I actually asked you. So make sure you actually hear the question. Try and refrain. Hold back from formulating your response right away in your head. Take the time to absorb the question. And when possible, remember names. I'll say it's probably the only thing I'm naturally good at is remembering names. But a lot of times why people can't remember names is because they're already formulating in their head how they're going to introduce themselves to the other person so they've already forgotten the person's name. Uh, appearance side, you know, you want to remember, be remembered for what you say in that interview, not for your fashion choices, right? And, you know, you want to be able to express individuality, absolutely, um, but you don't want to be too distracting in what you're coming in the door with or even on screen with. Personal hygiene, that's an in-person one. This is where remote is good. Um, personal hygiene or lack thereof. 
Um, sometimes distracting makeup nails or just general grooming, sometimes that that is going to be something somebody's going to remember more than that awesome project or program that you delivered. Um, and how you smell, yeah, that's an in-person one too. Do not wear cologne or perfume to an interview. Qu quite frankly, your interviewer could have allergies and Keisha has a great story about this that I definitely want her to share with you. I, I know that we're running fat, uh, low on time, but I once interviewed a candidate and his per, he had so much cologne on, we couldn't use like my office for the whole rest of the afternoon. Like it was hours. It was, and I had to move him out and we had to do the rest of his interview in the hallway because I thought I was going to have an asthma attack. So that's just bad. <laughs> right. But you won't be that guy. So nope. Or girl. Nope. All right. Next slide, Ellie. <clears throat> Okay, these are some good tips for virtual interviews. I think Keisha, you wanted to cover, maybe highlight a few things from here. Yeah, and I, I love that I think you all probably know a lot of these things, but you want the camera on. Remember, it's not just the content of what you're saying, but an employer is also trying to think about how you're gonna be presenting to clients, to other staff members. You know, if you are living with others, let them know that you're gonna be in a meeting. I did tell my puppy, he's ignoring me. Right, but I at least made the attempt. Um, but choosing a good quiet place where you wouldn't have interruptions and good strong Wi-Fi. And so that's always going to be I know, a challenge right now. If the morning of an interview, you know that the Wi-Fi has been a little spotty, let the interviewer know. And, and they might give you a phone number so that you're partly on screen and partly by, you know, telephone or something. I think that sometimes people will advise you should, if you have a Pepsi interview, you should put Pepsi in the background. Don't feel that you have to brand up, you know, because you don't, you know, does that come off as cheesy maybe? Um, but a clean background is great. Um, you know, a tidy room or, or use some kind of other like plants or something that's just sort of neutral in the background and avoid animation because sometimes the recording, um, especially if somebody who's on the committee can't make your session and they're trying to figure out, you know, or you're doing a presentation or something as part of your interview. And so they might say, hey, take your, your animated background down. So if you start without that, you won't cut into your own time. Um, so body language and energy, you know, if you're taking notes, because we're not in person, you can't tell what's happening every time I turn and look down. So just say, hey, I'm going to take some notes and just take some notes, right? But at least it lets the interviewer know that because you can't see. When you smile, which I love to have people do in telephone interviews, you know, do that telephone interview in front of a mirror or something reflective. Yes, it sounds corny as I don't know what, but when you're smiling, it sounds like you're excited about it. And so that should come across. So, you know, again, even in the Zoom room, you want to smile sometimes. You can be serious and passionate about something, but still smile because they're also looking for fit and will you be pleasant to work with? Um, if you are soft spoken, um, I am kind of loud, but lean in. Employers want to hear you. And when it's a struggle, if it feels like too much of a fight or they're repeating to you over and over, we can't hear you, they will give up and move on to the next. Um, if you don't understand a question or you didn't hear all of it, definitely you would do this in, in person as well. Ask them to repeat the question. Sometimes it buys you time if you're not really sure. Um, but if you also need a little bit of time to organize your thoughts, say that. Oh, that's a good, let me, let me think about that. Okay. And then you're able to collect your thoughts and then answer without just, just spilling forth without having sort of a plan. Always when you're in person, um, that's phone to phone, face to face, Zoom to Zoom, ask about the next steps. Because once you aren't clear about things and you're playing a catch up game with email, uh, ghosting is something the young people talk about with dating and all, but you want to be able to be clear about what the timeline is. Where are you in the process? Will you have to do an assessment coming up? What are the next steps so that you're clear so that you can start being prepared for a timeline and, and what's coming next? Um, Trisha, a, a good interviewer will tell you what the next steps are anyway, but it's okay to ask. Yeah. Yep. Next slide, Ellie. Okay. These are just a couple of sort of pocket techniques to go to for answering interview questions. If you need to structure, think about how you want to structure responses. You can, you know, just reference these. I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, but I think 
one of the one of the most annoying things I find with interviewees is when they're just talking and talking and talking in circles and they feel they need to fill all of the air and just keep talking and talking and talking and I haven't even answered my question. So sometimes this these techniques will help ground you to be able to get to the right uh, to get to a full response to a question. I don't think we need to drain these and you guys will get a copy of these slides anyway. So I think we can go to the next one, Ellie. Uh, these are just some suggested questions for interviewers. Again, you guys will have these slides, so I don't think we need to drain these, but if nothing else, use these as your one or two questions to go to. You're, you're welcome to have these and use these. Uh, you know, because like I said, if you're going to be asked if you have questions, if, if it's not anything specific that the interviewer has talked about, then have one or two of these ready to go because it does show you're genuinely interested uh, about the organization, about the opportunity. Um, I put the diversity and inclusion questions in there. That's that is something that matters to me with every company that I have worked with or for. And if it if it's not something that's a natural part of my role, it's something I've been involved with anyway. So you know maybe it's corporate responsibility, maybe it's community engagement, whatever. Put your topic in there that you'd prefer that you really want to know about the organization. And even if there's an opportunity in that role to get involved in your areas of passion and commitment. Next slide. All right, these are some good basic do's and don'ts. Um, do be courteous to any, anyone you meet. I don't care if it's the security guard. I don't care if it's the receptionist. I don't care if it's a, uh, an executive assistant, whomever it is, because I will ask, I will ask, you know, for example, my HR admin. So what'd you think? What was your first impression? You know, what was he like? What was she like? And if they said, oh my God, Trish, he was so rude. Guess what? You know, if, if you weren't even respectful and courteous to, you know, the, the HR admin or receptionist, then chances are you kind of treat anybody potentially. You don't know who you're meeting, so you want to be kind to everybody. Bring extra copies of your resume just in case or be prepared to send them should they ask. Um, also, the references. Sometimes people put on their resume uh, references available upon request. Um, Take a few seconds to think about the answer to your question, right? And as Keisha said, ask to have it repeated if needed. What I said earlier, actually answer the actual questions asked of you. Um, ask the good questions so you're interested. Send a thank you note within a week of the interview at least, you know, if not within a couple of days. Handwritten notes still have a nice touch, but you know, it's not necessarily expected nowadays. The don'ts, do not take any calls or texts. Silence your phone, turn it off if you can. Um, don't talk negatively about anybody or anything because really that only puts you in a bad light. Doesn't matter the topic, just don't talk negatively about anything. And this is again, don't talk in circles or feel you have to fill the silence and avoid the non words and phrases. Um, uh, like, you know, the um, Keisha laughed at this. You know, my kids learned from an early age that um stands for University of Maryland, you know, like the shuttle um on the side of the bus. So um is the non word, it stands for University of Maryland. Uh, don't initiate discussions about money. Uh, stay away from politics and religion. Until they bring up money with you, do not bring it up because that's pretty presumptuous of you. So don't bring it up until it comes up on, the, on the, their side. Uh, do not share or ask about any personal or private information. And again, don't fake your answers or experiences because we'll spot the BS right away. Next slide. All right, these are some resources that Keisha and I outlined that thought we thought would be helpful for you. Um, I'll talk about the bottom three. I mean, these are like more external uh, job type places that'll give you video vignettes on tips for how to answer questions, uh, other things. So Career Sherpa is one of my favorite places to go. The Muse is another one and, and a good one for startups that Keisha added. And then Keisha, I'll let you talk about more about the Career Center ones. I think that sometimes we all forget the wonderful resources we still have available to us. So we've dropped in the link for um, Career Terps, uh, the University of Maryland Career Center. Your college might have a career center, um, but you still have access to Careers for Terps. There are LinkedIn groups. And then this way you can also see what upcoming job fairs, workshops, all kinds of events that are coming down the pike. So be sure you have an active mm -hmm. and to connect with the Career Center folks. I think that's it. Yep, that's it. I think that's a uh, next is a Q&A slide. I know we only have a couple of minutes of time. I mean, I, I can I can stay on if people did want to uh, stay on for a little bit. I don't know what the time allows for Ellie, but um, 
I can go back to Joe's question. I found that I rec have recently been disqualified for a position out of state because I'm not located there without being able to attach a cover letter and with resume going into their format, how can you communicate that you're willing to relocate? Um, I, I mean, they'll ask you, I actually don't put my address, my home address on my resume. I don't. And nowadays with mobile numbers, it doesn't matter. Everybody ports their number wherever they go anyway. So, um, you know, sometimes th if you're filling out an application, they may even specifically ask you, ask you if you're willing to relocate, but not every application site will have that. So um, I think it, it, it lends itself more that they're not willing to pay for relocation. Yeah. And so, you know, if you were relocating to the area anyway, you know, you could make that very clear that you've got friends and family in the area, you're relocating, um, that you're, you're not asking for support for relocation. Yeah, yeah. But you may not have to volunteer that information up front. Any other questions? It looks like we have someone who raised their hand, actually. I know there's some coming into the chat, okay. but um, take the Sumaira, hand. it looks like um, you had a question for us. So if you want to take yourself off mute, go ahead. Hello. Um, yeah, I would like to ask that um, uh, your your first of all, your uh, this is very helpful. And um, these days, I'm interviewing a lot of companies. Um, I don't know. Fortunately, unfortunately, it's it's, it's a lot of work. And uh, this uh, this presentation is very helpful. So recently, in an interview, uh, uh, it was an interesting situation for me. Um, I was prepared for the interview. I had researched the company and everything, and then um, uh, they had they asked me a question towards the end. They asked me this general question, that it's been asked to me before. Uh, that uh, do you have any questions for us? And um, I uh, had actually, they had actually discussed uh, the question that I had prepared beforehand um, uh, already. And I was kind of stuck for a moment there. And then I had to explain it to them uh, that, um, you know, uh, those were the questions, but uh, we had already discussed them. Uh, do you think that was the right response? And uh, what, what should one do if there's a situation like that? If it were me, I would have made up another question quickly in my head. And now you have several examples from the slide deck that Ellie will send out to you that you can go to because you should always have a few questions uh, ready to go. And granted, maybe that you might have had three and they, they had already sort of answered or addressed all three as part of the interview and the information they shared. But yeah, I would have made something up just to come up with something else. Can be something general, you know. Again, something you know, just just to have ready to have always have two or three ready to go. That's what I would recommend. Also, if you use the Muse.com, there are all kinds of templates. There are employer questions. Um, if you're doing research on the company ahead of time. Start thinking about how you might be on a project or how might you might do something in a role. So it'll help you with some of the more um, hands-on questions. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Teresa's question, how many follow-ups should you do after an interview and how long should you wait between follow-ups? Yeah, this is a hard one. Uh, you know, I mean, you don't want to look like you're stalking the recruiter or the hiring manager. Um, it is hard to be patient. And I, uh, there's a guy that I worked with at Accenture. I haven't been his HR rep since 2005. The guy still calls me for career advice anytime. And he, this is one of his things that he struggles with. It's like, Trish, I haven't heard from the recruiter in like a week. And I'm like, Michael, you are not the only person that they've interviewed. And also this might feel like it's 100% what you're filling your time with. You know, the hiring managers actually have a day job to do, right? The recruiters are recruiting for a number of positions at any given time. So it is hard to be patient. Uh, you know, if they don't set expectations, again, a good interview or a recruiter will say, next steps will be X. You can expect to hear from us by the end of next week. Um, so, I mean, I would say a week, wait for a week after an interview. Um, I know that might be kind of hard for some of our, our younger generation because everything is, is instantaneous now for you, like on social media and responses and all of that. Um, but just remember people have jobs and while this is maybe 100% of your focus, you are not 100% of theirs. So don't go into stalker mode because that is the best way to turn off a, a recruiter or even a hiring manager. I think also when you get the timeline, it helps. And so again, you have the interview. Um, I think that people, sometimes employers will tell you, 
the process, but not necessarily the timeline. So when you ask and you have a good sense, um, and, I, and I think Trish is absolutely right, that you know, most people that are hiring for a role, they also have their regular day job to do in addition to the, the hiring part. Um, I know it's tough, it's tough to be patient. It is, it is, but again, you, you do have to be patient. I mean, like I said, I think a week is a reasonable amount of time to follow up. Um, and you know, they'll respond and hopefully get back to you accordingly. And if they don't respond, then, you know, fine. Just don't, don't let that be your only opportunity that you're pursuing, you know, just let that one ride out. So you don't look like a stalker and put your efforts elsewhere. Right. Um, tips for jobs in federal agencies or public organizations. I mean, I think all of these tips that we provided apply. I will say that their application process can be very laborious, uh, filling out their, you know, KSIs, whatever it is. It's a very long process. Um, but, you know, I think everything that Keisha and I have shared today is, is applicable, both private and public sector. And you definitely want to use, if you're applying on USA Jobs, use their uh, template for resumes. And so it's a plug and play. So you open it up and you're moving things from your resume, probably in a Word document into their template and format. And that'll just really help you. It's longer, it's gonna feel repetitive, but it's what they're looking for. So what's gonna be relevant for the audience, right? Yeah, this last question, I love this one as, as, as an HR leader myself. What about age? How do you maneuver that? What, um, what about career switch? First of all, it's illegal to ask anything related to age, gender, sexual orientation, religion, family status. It is illegal. So, you know, if that those interviewers should totally stay away from that. I mean, I've had to counsel interviewers like asking somebody an interviewee, well, what church do you go to? I'm like, oh my God, Richard, you can't ask that. So it is illegal to ask those questions because you can't discriminate based on those, those uh, protected classes, um, classes, if you will. Um, you know, as far as maneuvering about a career switch, I mean, you could have plenty of other reasons for a career switch that aren't at all related to age. So, you know, don't, don't fall into having to answer those age questions. I don't even put the year that I graduated from Maryland on my resume, just because, you know, people will infer that, so. Not anymore, know. not anymore. I, I, did, I didn't even want it on the slides for this presentation. <laughs> I think that's a great question. I mean, one of the things is go back to your elevator pitch and introducing yourself. I've been, you know, I had worked, I have a, a background in, and I worked for several years. I found that I'm really drawn to, and so help somebody understand your progression and what's going on with the transition. Yep. Um, next question, should we visit the interviewer's LinkedIn page before the interview? Eh, I myself go to the website to see who I can find on there. LinkedIn, I have premium LinkedIn. I'm sure Keisha does too. So it's kind of funny when my son's friends I see have checked out my profile. I'm like, hey, I saw Wes check me out. And he's like, oh my God, I didn't know you, you could tell. I'm like, yeah, you can see who's checking you out. So likely the interviewer has premium. So they will see if you are looking them up. I mean, I don't think that's a bad thing because chances are they're doing it to you too or the recruiter might be looking you up. Right. I, I, I don't recommend it. Maybe after the interview, it, it does, it could come across a little bit as stalking, but you know, if you, if you do it, then don't be creepy about it. You know, it's always weird when then somebody sees something on my LinkedIn and they're like, I see you like Afro-Brazilian dance. And I'm like, that's only on my LinkedIn. <laughs> so, you know, like, so again, just don't be like creepy. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't bring that up and don't try to use that as a way to like get in good with the interviewer. If that's what you're doing it for. <laughs> I would wait to look after the interview. That might be a little more reasonable. They might even invite you to connect. So um, looks like that is it for the questions in the chat. Don't know if there's anything else, if anybody wanted to throw anything else out there. We have our contact information in case you Next slide. Yep. follow up questions um, and our LinkedIn's. Um, in case you want to, since I, then I, I made it not sound very inviting talking about being creepy. On, but, um, well, you we're putting it out there. So you're, you're invited to reach out to us, except yes. when you do ask to be connected on LinkedIn, just let me know. This is, hey, you know, I attended your webinar, you know, for the class of 2020. Uh, just let me know that. Then that, that'd be a good way for us to connect. But I'm happy to connect with anybody. And uh, like I said, I'm about to launch my own company. And if anybody's interested in some of that one-on-one -on -one coaching for this, I will take you on as a client at a cut rate, new graduate rate. So Amazing. Well, Trish and Keisha, you both shared so much valuable information. Is there anything else that um, you wanted to cover? Any last 
parting words before I wrap up? No, just best of luck to all of you with your Absolutely. you know future next steps, all of that. And yeah, if there's anything Keisha and I can do to, to help you through that, um, obviously we are very much still connected with University of Maryland. So we're, we're happy to be here for you too. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much. Um, sounds like folks were really engaged and really learned a lot from this information. So we really appreciate you both speaking on this topic today. Um, there will be a recording sent out of this webinar um, in your inbox later this afternoon, as well as a copy of the PowerPoint if you, if you wanted to refer back to any of the wisdom that Trish and Keisha shared. Um, you can also check out the Alumni Association homepage to learn more about some of the career resources we offer for young alumni, for alumni in any stage of their career. So feel free to check that out as well. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. Again, huge thank you to Trish and Keisha. And last but not least, go Terps. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. <clears throat>